apologize for <laughs> muting. So uh, I've, I've already outed myself as the non cybersecurity expert here. So what I will do is give a very, very quick overview of, of what we're going to talk about today of their respective bios, and then we'll, we'll dive right into the conversation. And so we see huge amounts of physical energy infrastructure, especially down in this part of the world that many of us hail from. And what we're really seeing there are the blood vessels of the system. What we're going to spend a lot of time and attention talking about today is the nervous system, which is so intimately cyber enabled that underpins the operations of so many of these, uh, you know, in many instances, literally life critical assets in society. Uh, with us today for this discussion are Robert Lee, who's the CEO and founder of the industrial cybersecurity firm known as Dragos. Uh, we have Dr. Thomas Winston, who is a professor of cybersecurity engineering at George Mason University. And we have Chris Bronk, who is an assistant professor at the Center for Information Security Research and Edu Education uh, here at the University of Houston. And very glad to have each one of them. I have to admit, I'm a little nervous as a lawyer. I feel like I'm about to cross-examine experts who know 10 to maybe 10,000 times as much as I do. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to launch and you know, we'll start with you, Robert. You have the unfortunate uh, place of being right next to my icon on the screen. So I'll start with you and we'll go uh, through each of you to take about five minutes and talk about some of the things that you think are the most pressing and perhaps also underappreciated cybersecurity issues that various parts of the energy value chain presently face. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Uh, when we look at energy infrastructure, and I will use that broadly, not only in oil and gas, but electric and natural gas resources and, and similar. When we look at energy from a cybersecurity context, um, there's a lot of different ways to sort of dissect the problem. And historically, We've done a very good job looking at the enterprises of those companies, and those companies have made a lot of investments in the cybersecurity work of those. Now, we always have room to grow and do better, um, but I, can't, I don't think anybody can say the defensive state of the, the community is the same as it was 10 years ago. Like we've, we've significantly grown. The challenge that I see for our industry is as we go towards sort of chasing revenue opportunities that we need to do in the com as companies using new technologies and data analytics and cloud enabled access and similar, we're, we're undergoing a digital transformation or infrastructure. And I, and I do think that ends up being a bit of a buzzword to some folks, but it does mean hyper connectivity and a lot of new technologies inside of our plant operations environments um, that have historically not been there. And why that is important is the investments we've made into the enterprise side of the house have not been on the same level of what we're doing on the industrial control system or operations technology side of the house. And it is not fair to say that we're in a great place there. And that's not to dismiss a lot of the amazing work that's happening with folks. And there are some companies that are taking an absolutely amazing position and doing good work there, but it's a hard challenge to really go after. And there's not been a lot of insights into that world um, sort of readily available to folks. I would say only about the last five to six years have we even really had enough insights on what the threats are doing to that side of the house um, to really think about what our cybersecurity strategies will be for our industrial operations environments. So you take an environment that needs to be treated differently. You can't just copy and paste IT security standards into your operations environments. You, you take an environment that's different, different culture around it, different stakeholders, different mission requirements, different threats, and you start hyper connective, you know, uh, connecting everything up at the same time that adversaries are getting more aggressive and smarter, that is, that is absolutely a worrying trend. So I don't think the, the movies and the books that say, oh my gosh, power grids are gonna go down, oil plants are gonna go uh, blow up. Like I, I think there's a lot of hype, but where we're going over that next five to 10 years, there is a significantly changing landscape and threat landscape that do converge into some significant uh, risk scenarios. A, a good example of one um, was the traces attack in 2017 in Saudi Arabia, where a state power explicitly went after safety systems in a petrochemical environment with the explicit intent to kill people at that site. Like that's not the same type of challenge we're used to dealing with. And, and if I can kind of wrap it up, um, what I would say fundamentally what I see is 
a good bit of enterprise security tends to train a mindset of high frequency, low impact analysis of system security and data security. But when you're looking at industrial operations and our energy infrastructure, you're looking at low frequency, high impact attacks, and you're looking at system of system security. And so the approach, the training, the process, the culture, everything around it is a big shift for companies. And if they don't lay down the right strategy and foundation for that, they're just going to waste a lot of resources with a lot of like feel good security measures instead of an actual strategy. Okay. Tom, turning over to you and then we'll turn to Chris. Yes, thank you. Um, you can hear me? All right. Clear. Um, yeah, you know, certainly uh, to sort of dovetail into what uh, Robert said, the the way of looking at these sorts of attacks, the vectors, the types of attacks, um, the types of things that, you know, I teach certainly at, at George Mason, um, is definitely a system of systems and the approach that we take uh, sort of educating, you know, the next, the next generations of, of folks um, is, you know, looking at really a hardcore systems engineering approach to um, cybersecurity problems with the focus, you know, lots of heavy dosing of uh, hardware reverse engineering and things like that. So from my perspective, um, academically, and I'll, I'll touch on my perspective uh, from the US government in a moment, um, my perspective academically, I think that there's just a big change in how we have to teach cybersecurity. And it is way beyond, um, you know, the defense in depth, sort of, let's just, let's just throw 800-53 at everything and then convert it into some other sort of standard. Um, it, you know, and it, it, go, it goes way, way beyond um, sort of the, the standard approach um, and, and I remember many, many years ago, I was teaching, you know, students about firewalls and that was, you know, just the most wonderful thing in the world. And now it's kind of like, mm, you know, that's not very interesting. And we certainly see with like APT, um, the APTs, you know, the, fire, the, the work that Dragos does and the work that companies like FireEye do and CrowdStrike, that there's, there's a, a growing need to understand, you know, more in depth um, sorts of attacks. So, so that's, that's kind of how we're, the program where I'm teaching at George Mason, we're morphing from doing just to, let's look at one attack type approach to let's look at a series of attacks. Let's, let's figure out how to, you know, create some decision support, you know, heuristic, pump it into some machine learning algorithm, and then teach systems how to respond better to the sorts of attacks that are happening. Now, of course, uh, Robert's seeing this, you know, in, in, in the wild, I'm seeing this uh, from the, through the lens of an academic at this point. So it's very different. Um, and yeah, but you'll solve it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so from, from the perspective of when I was working in the U.S. government, I think um, Robert was mentioning this earlier when, when we first got on, there was definitely an appetite, but I have to tell you, honestly, um, in 2013, August, uh, the, the account to handle and study and investigate uh, ICS SCADA uh, security worldwide was thrown to me. It was, it was nobody wanted to do it. And here you go, Tom, we're, we're, this, this was my position in the U.S. intelligence community. Here you go, Tom, nobody wants this, so, so it's yours now, so get up to speed. Um, <laughs> and I think, I mean, I think there's, a, there's much more awareness today, certainly, than there was when I started. Um, there, was, there were certainly people in the U.S. I see who started looking at this, you know, in 2004 and 2005. But, but yeah, there's definitely, there's an appetite for it, and the approach that we take at George Mason is very different from, um, you know, let's just let's just you know, learn DMP3 protocol and teach students how to capture DMP3 packets. And here's what an attack looks like. We need to look at everything you know, holistically. So and I'll, I'll turn it over now. Thank you. Well, thanks. I go, hope everyone can hear me OK as well. Um, uh, dirty little secret, Tom and I worked in the same startup uh, over 20 years ago when we were young men. Uh, so it's a, delightful to, to have a, a, a relationship continue for so many years. Um, and for us to both go into the, you know, I did the cyber thing at the State Department, so I don't have to say intelligence community, because obviously that's not part of the intelligence community. Um, and it was also a redheaded portfolio. It was a stepchild. Um, so the important thing for me, uh, you know, I never thought that cybersecurity on energy would be the vehicle for me to go give a speech at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York City. Um, but the money guys care. Um, and that's really where we are. Uh, you know, I, since coming to Houston, I've realized a lot about how energy works, about particularly oil and gas and how it works. And disruptions in oil and gas are, are, are fiscally and often um, uh, more than just fiscally fatal events. I mean, if you have something that breaks 
in a big midstream process someplace, shutting it down and bringing it back up is not just like rebooting your Windows PC. So um, like Tom, I'm an educator now. I am, I am no longer affiliated with the US government in any way other than all the grant money that they wish to send me, which I'm delighted to have. Um, and you know, for me, the energy issue, you know, uh, I worked with uh, my colleague Enikin Tick up in, uh, in uh, Estonia on, on these issues almost a decade ago. Uh, and we wrote a paper about what happened to Aramco as a result of Shamoon. And what I liked about that paper at the time, and I still think is pretty good, is that we combined kind of an information systems approach with an international security approach. Um, and the thing in my discussions with Enikin and then with uh, several other colleagues over the years uh, that became very important were, you know, in cybersecurity, we were always concerned about the what of the attack, what happened, and the how of the attack, how did it happen? And, you know, I would talk to executives in the energy sector and, and I would say, well, why did this happen? Why were you attacked? Why was your, you know, infrastructure a target in the first place? Um, and, you know, when Shamoon happened, and, you know, there were several other things like, um, I guess it was the Heartbleed bug issue, problem, whatever you want to call it. Um, which was basically a, a Linux operating system, Apache web server issue. Um, you know, I had to go talk to a, a mid-major, a mid-sized oil company in Houston about it, like the day after it, it dropped. And, you know, the, the company, I, I said, well, you just need to find every system you have running Apache uh, uh, on, on a Linux box somewhere in your forest of, of devices and fix it. And you know the CISO and the CIO just didn't know what to do, um, and this is a long time ago. And I'm I'm way out of practice on this now. I'll be, you know, people like Robert are, are right on the on the front of it, um, you know. And I'm teaching the students, but you know, the good news in teaching the students that we see in our program, um, which much like Tom's is a NSA certified CAE, blah blah blah, is we are having students come in now who have some understanding of the process control sector, of, uh, of how infrastructure works, and we're able to train them, eh, you know, as full-time graduate students usually, in a, a year or two, really two years, that they can go back out to a company like Chevron or Marathon or, or any other, you know, major oil company and make a difference. And we've had students come from Saudi Arabia and Nigeria and other major petroleum exporters uh, and they're making a difference, but still their level of confidence uh, is not what I would say is complete. What, what would it take to make that complete at the risk of asking an overly simplistic question here? Well, I mean, the, the problem is that, that I think this, I, I, I am of the belief that many of these issues can become um, machine uh, solved solutions. I mean, I think a lot of technical security issues can eventually be figured out uh, by machine, by, by prompting. I just saw that CSIS yesterday had a, 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 a br issue brief on formal logic as a solution to cybersecurity problems. Um, that's great. Formal logic uh, is what drives a lot of computer science programs. But um, I've worked in startups, uh, worked in a startup with Tom, and uh, I knew nothing about formal logic at the time. I only knew get the code done. Um, and I think that, that you have to think out a system, a computerized infrastructure system, the way you think out um, any sort of piece of, uh, of complex working material. You know, We think a lot about how an A380 should work, um, but we have not always applied rubrics of formal logic to building up systems of systems. Uh, there's a colleague of mine who's been in, in the Air Force research establishment, Kamal Jabour, who's been pushing for for formal logic-based computer science programs for a long, long time. But that computer science does not necessarily translate to the organizational operations of a corporation building real infrastructure. And I think that's, that's the educational problem that we we are trying to unpack every day in my program is, you know, how do you create a logic that works here that is going to 
uh, be flexible, but at the same time, that the machines that you work with are going to respond in a way that you can anticipate fairly well. I don't think we have that now. So as we talk about bits and bytes and perhaps the interface where they start to meet pipes and wires, we actually have a question from the audience here. Uh, are you gentlemen able to outline how power generators and grid operators are dealing with potential cyber threats and how you see this space evolving uh, in coming years? Sure, I, I can take the first stab at that. Um, work a lot in the power community across DOE and FERC and NERC and many of the asset owners and operators. And first and foremost, I, I think this touches a little bit on kind of what is the role of, of systems and machine learning and similar. I think there's a lot of desire to put a foundation of security in better design. There's a, a, a really good government effort right now led to the Department of Energy looking at consequence driven cyber informed engineering to have better engineering of systems to engineer out certain cyber risk scenarios. So the, the electric community is looking for kind of that foundation layer to be assisted with government because it's really long-term problems and academia and looking at what the role of regulations can be. Where I think the power community has struggled before um, but is doing a good job now of looking at this is not getting into the compliance heavily regulated industry kind of problem of saying this is it and treating it as a foundation and going yeah and on top of that we're going to need really smart humans that know this problem understand that we're going up against human threats and how can we go above the regulations to do the things to reduce risk to our companies and that always hasn't been the topic i think there have been a couple companies that have always been sort of the leaders in their community but across the power generation and power transmission and distribution communities that's definitely not been the case there's a probably a policy level issue here as well though that we always come back to the roles and responsibilities of government versus private sector, how those two actually partner together to get this right. I think government sometimes, and this is as a former government person too, likes to view this as industry. It's like, there's a little bit more there than just industry and figuring out where to partner um, and do it appropriately. And what I mean by that sort of specifically too, is the federal government isn't going to come out and make um, regulations as it relates to distribution state level infrastructure that's going to be largely state level issues. But when you start talking about something as complex as the bulk electric system made up of multiple grids and infrastructure, it matters what Texas is doing versus California. It matters what sort of that um, uh, picture looks like across the country. And I'll, I'll kind of end it in saying, some of the worst scenarios that we're preparing for aren't vulnerabilities and exploits and things that are gonna be taken care of in that foundation. Some of the worst things we're preparing for are misuse of the system, like we've seen in the Ukraine attacks, where it wasn't about malware or exploits. It was about the adversary understanding grid operations. And if I can open a relay, I can keep it open through a network communications. If I can uh, close a relay, I can do it through network communications. And so it's native functionality. And you can't engineer that piece away so easily. And, and that's not a regulatable thing. And so I think the industry right now is looking very heavily at what are the scenarios we care about most? Let's prioritize those and get together as a community on how to solve those. Tom, did you or Chris have anything to add on that? We have some more audience questions here, but if you guys have Go to more thoughts on that, would happily, happily happy for you to share them. Yeah, I can jump in real quick here. Um, the, you know, it's interesting that um, it took, I remember it took me many years of briefing uh, downtown policymakers to get them to actually recognize that there was a problem. Now it's obvious that everybody recognizes there's a problem, but then the question becomes, you know, how do we actually fix the problem? And, and of course, one of the things that I used to look at extensively that probably still doesn't receive the attention it should was supply chain issues, um, development of, you know, components, uh, not just U.S. companies, but companies like Schneider Electric and, and, and others that sort of have worldwide reach and worldwide penetration. Um, the supply chain was always a, a, of interest. I, I think it was of interest certainly to me as a vector that wasn't being sort of investigated enough. Um, you know, of course, we've seen we've seen things happen. Uh, DHS released something about Huawei and ZTE just about 18 months ago saying, yeah, there might be a problem. And then, and then there was the Kaspersky Lab revelation. Um, and we're talking about, we're, we're talking about software versus hardware, obviously there, but the supply chain issue, I think is something that might addressing the supply chain issues might address. Um, and, and I mean this 
I, I fully mean this in a non-political way uh, for, for Chris, because Chris, Chris will jump on me if I, <laughs> um, so I just, you know, I think if we look at that carefully, um, it might be a starting point because everybody knows there's a problem. It's just that like, like Robert said, you know, if, if we can keep the relay open with an net, open network connection, you know, how do we, how do we actually, how do we actually stop that? And this goes way beyond insider threat or, you know, discussions about, you know, the person, the worst threat is the, the person working at the desk. So I think, I think if we look at sort of a, you know, how the global supply chain, you know, handles this and, and, and is secured, we have a piece, but it's certainly not the solution. And I turn, I'll, I'll stop now. Yeah. And the only thing I'd want to add on this is a couple of years ago to bring this back to Texas, because this is a Baker Institute event, um, Houston, uh, um, Representative uh, Carol Alvarado uh, up in the, uh, the state legislature convened um, a utilities group a couple of years ago and it was water and uh, electrical. Uh, and it was very interesting because the one thing that became very apparent to all involved, especially in the electricity side, and Texas has its own peculiarities of ERCOT, but also um, just size of providers varies widely. The market here is slightly different than many other places. Um, mm -hmm. But the, 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 the idea of mutual assistance was something they immediately grabbed onto. So how can that you know, rural power collective get help from Centerpoint, which is a massive company? And mm -hmm. how can groups kind of work together? Um, and basically what the, the industry got was a, a fairly solid green light from Austin saying, well, you know, we're not going to worry about lawyers so much if you guys have to help each other getting through a crisis or working on a problem. Uh, and that, I think, was a productive move. And, you know, okay. If I could, before we move on to the supply chain one, just because I, I find this to be incredibly an interesting conversation, and uh, it is one that's definitely got Congress's attention right now as well. Uh, from a supply chain aspect, I'll highlight too, though, too many folks put the supply chain category neatly into a box. And I know Tom and Chris are not those that do that, but when we look at supply chain, uh, I think the interconnection, which Tom was hitting on, is really important. There are power generation sites in, in North America on the renewable side, not bulk electric system under NERCSIP, but renewable side that are owned by a bank, operated by a Spanish company, connected into your local provider. Like there's, there's supply chain risk that isn't adversarial, even if a transformer went down for some reason and they didn't pre-negotiate and it's made in China. It's not three months like people like to say, it's generally closer to six months on the best uh, time frame to get that replaced, even non-adversarial. So then you start layering in if somebody's being a jerk about it and everybody gets really concerned. But what supply chain isn't often is the microchip and the hardware kind of discussion. And I find not that we shouldn't think about that, but people over-focus on or their hardware back doors or whatever else, when that's not the issue at hand, the issue at hand largely relates to sourcing and remote interaction and software upgrades on that uh, equipment. So I think as we talk about some of these different things with the supply chain and other associated issues, it, it, it logically begs a question, and there's actually another one that's coming from the audience here is, what is the nature of some of the cyber th threats that have been seen in recent years and how is that picture evolving? And I'll, I'll, I'll put a little bit of concreteness here. For instance, is this something where it tends to be non-state actors, maybe like some of the groups out of Eastern Europe that are more motivated by financial gain or are we seeing this as something that's more dominated by state actors that are maybe after something different altogether? Or maybe none of the above. Yeah. I'll take first shot at it. Um, on the ICS side, so I'll speak. I'll, I'll speak specifically to OT and ICS. I think Chris and Tom will um, be able to complement the other side as well. And for OT and ICS, for for some of us who aren't as technologically yeah. steeped as you Sorry, guys, if there is any, do you mind just industrial operations? So industrial control okay. systems, operation technology, your plant side okay. equipment, okay. SCADA, DCS, PCN, that kind of stuff. Um, but okay. industrial. Thank you. Um, when you're dealing with physics, there you go. When dealing with the physics side of it. Uh, the threats that we're seeing today are state actors. Um, that is not to say that there are not non-state actors that are heavily curious. They are very ICS curious, but the ones that are able to execute and orchestrate operations today are state actors. 
Today at my firm, we track 13 different state groups that exclusively target industrial control system environments. And that is light years in difference to where we were a couple of years ago. And I would not say we have perfect visibility. That's just with where our reach is that we can see that. So I, I usually tell people that the threat is not as bad as they want to imagine. This isn't diehard stuff, but it is way worse than they realize that there is a lot of activity going on in these industrial organizations. But what I'm concerned about um, is that state adversary tradecraft always bleeds down to non-state actors over time. And we as an industry are very heterogeneous today. The Honeywell environment versus the Yokogawa DCS, and you start going even inside the same company, one rig is different than another versus the pipeline operations, et cetera. But with that digital transformation kind of discussion, you start getting into a very homogenous infrastructure and you get scalability at homogenous infrastructure. So there's a natural in non-scalability aspect with heterogeneous infrastructure. All I say, um, all, all to line up to say that the today's state actors are exposing a lot of how-to playbooks that as our industry changes, those non-state actors will converge at a point. And our industry is doing a good job trying to keep up. I think there's a lot more to go, but they're doing a good job of keeping up. But there becomes an inflection point where it gets extremely uncomfortable very quickly. And when it's non-state actors, you don't have the normal tools of economic sanctions, military actions, et cetera. And, and I am quite a bit concerned about where that hockey puck is going to. Okay. Tom and Chris, you have any any thoughts on that one? Chris? Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, I remember um, I remember oh back in 2009 or so, 2010, um, we used to see we used to track money and the tracking money with state actors was always the way we knew something bad was happening. Um, money toward research and development programs that we're looking into, you know, sort of weaponizing, you know, you know, cyber in a way. And I hate that. I'm sorry. I hate that term. Um, but, but, but using, using tools, you know, created by software engineers and hardware engineers to, um, you know, wreak havoc. Um, we, we, so we used to track the money. And when we saw state actors, uh, you know, pumping large amounts of money into, you know, certain elements, and we'll just, we'll just leave it at that. Uh, we knew, okay, this, this element's probably developing, you know, they've got an R and D program. Now they're looking into um, control systems, control system uh, technologies. Um, and again, uh, that was sort of the thing that, and then, and then suddenly by 2016, we saw non-state actors uh, doing dumb things. We'll, we'll refer to them as is less, I hate, to, I also hate this term sophisticated um, because sophistications, you know, in the eye of the beholder, um, but, but they were doing things that were actually, you know, they were knocking on doors. They were, they were looking into things, um, you know, you, you, you capture them on um, intranet sort of, uh, you know, deep web pages, looking at, you know, entering password after password and trying, you know, basic SQL injection. So, so again, this is, this, this is nothing, this is door rattling. It's not, it's nothing to lose sleep about or even consider, but, 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 you know, sort of dovetailing on what, what Robert said, yeah, the, the state actors, at some point, the state actor technology, the state actor, you know, sort of approach to having these well-funded R&D programs does leach into the non-state actors or some of the state actors become non-state actors or, I mean, who knows how that works. Um, but, but basically we do, there, there will, you know, in the, in the near future, there could be some sort of, um, you know, inflection point where the non-state actors have suddenly taken on um, what appears to be more of a state actor typed approach um, to, you know, attacking control systems and SCADA systems and, and, you know, any, any connectivity between those systems and, you know, IT, so OT, IT overlays. Yeah, I, I, picking up on both, both of the guys, um, there's a bad guyology of all cyber activity. Um, you know, Eastern Europeans I look at as as government employees who may may do some moonlighting on the side or vice versa, or people who are pressed into to work. You know, the most interesting thing that, that I've seen in the last few years, as far as a bigger picture of the issue is um, there's a company up in Dallas, uh, I think it's still called Latitude Technologies, but I haven't checked. And it was the natural gas transaction clearinghouse company. It was, it was a, you know, that company that's in the business of making sure the money comes in and the gas goes out. And, you know, when I was quizzed about it, 
it was, well, why would anyone care about financial transactions? And I was like, it's not one financial transaction and you're not like going to try to, to break payment systems on this, although that would be novel and interesting in some ways, I suppose. The problem that they didn't wrap their heads around was it's all the payments. It's the whole network. You see the business side of the operation and you get the intel on that. And then you map it over to the OT side of the environment and you have a complete picture. So that is something I didn't see as being an activity. You know, I, you know, I had thrown at me, these are criminals, right? They're going to steal money. And I was like, well, maybe this is an intelligence activity, right? And I think, I think, I, I think it's borne out that it was, but you know, we're, it's all subject to, to uh, what we can talk about, some of us not being under, under NDA. Um, so, you know, fundamentally, you know, the thing I have thought about in a non-state actor is, you know, we have, you know, I'm, I'm working on a project on student activism right now because um, I'm interested in it. And when are we going to have, we've already had, an, you know, Anonymous launch their unbelievably poor op oil or in gas or whatever they called it a few years ago. It was a dismal failure. Uh, they hacked some gas stations in England. Um, but we should be concerned um, as we look at activism uh, and energy, and especially oil and gas, uh, that oil and gas is perennially unpopular with uh, social movements on clean energy, on global climate change. Uh, so there, to say that there won't be a wacky activist group that will come together and congregate. And I, you know, I've had to reckon with Anonymous a couple of times in my career, and they're always interesting. And there's always, in my interactions with them, there's always this kind of bizarro disconnect between level of technical competence, which sometimes can be quite high, and kind of, we'll call it kind of societal political naivete, that if they do a thing, something will happen. And it's like, well, that's not really how society works. Um, so, uh, I would say that, that, you know, the nation state matters now, but like any other form of political activity that can be undertaken, uh, groups below the nation state have proven again and again that they can adapt. I mean, they're not going to engage in conventional conflict over the South China Sea, but, uh, there are a lot of other things that loose cyber collectives might be able to do in the future. Now, as, as we start to think you know, potentially about a much greater non-state type of threat. What type of concern is there that you guys have seen in each of your respective roles of insider problems emanating from uh, within the company itself, as opposed to somebody cracking in the door from outside? I can, I can jump on that a little bit. Um, there's, you know, Insider threat is always, of course, listed as you know the number one threat because these these are your friends, these are your colleagues, these are the people who have badges. Um, they're the people who are expected to be seen at work every day. Um, there's obviously a whole bunch of you know sort of empirical data about the role insider threat plays, um, you know, in in certain milieu, right? Like the intelligence community, you hear about the leakers, you hear about those things, um, the Vault 7 re revelations, things like that, um, which which are horrible, uh, you know, in their own right. But it, looking at people who are working on the inside, I don't think that there's a, a really good body of evidence right now about, uh, from what I've seen, and I, I, I'm, I'm hoping Robert can shine some light on this, actually. Um, I, I haven't seen too much of that. There's one instance I can think of in Europe, in the 2015 timeframe, where there was an insider who who did who allowed access to somebody, which which caused some some type of cyber disruption in the system, and it was a uh, an industrial environment. So, but I, other than that, I can't actually think of too many examples. So I'll 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 stop here and turn it over to the others. Yeah, and and so I would agree with that. So there are examples; they come up and we hear about them all the time. But Tom's right; they're much few and far between than I think people realize. There's everything from the Australian sewage plant, you know, way back when to uh, like undisclosed cases, um, which uh, I'll be careful here, but like even inside the American power system, uh, we've had cases of, of disgruntled employees or people that were getting fired, abusing accesses and having near miss events um, that would have otherwise been big deals. Um, but on the insider threat discussion, what I find happens, like you, you should absolutely think through 
privilege access and similar, all the normal security tools of what could somebody do? And do we want somebody to be completely unmonitored and doing things in critical environments? Like that's just a good like buddy check system anyways. And mm -hmm. if you are thinking about native functionality in the system and trying to defend against it, whether it's internal or external, you're still talking about native functionality. And so it's still the same use cases, but we need to be careful uh, on the inside of threat story, because what I typically see happen is every instance of phishing gets counted as insider threat because, well, it was your person that clicked on the email. And we have a large culture that's kind of changing, but a large historical culture of victim blaming that does us no good in our community. And and I, I will speak from, so I was still in the NSA when Snowden happened. And before I got out, there was a big, Oh, insider threat here. All this stuff is well, everyone's a threat now. And it killed the culture. Like everybody was like, Oh, is this us? So I thought we were the good guys. Like, you know, are we the baddies now, you know, this whole culture um, shift that took place. And so when you talk about insider threats inside your companies, I'm not saying don't address it, but I wouldn't make it the number one thing. And I would be very careful with how you define it and how you try to solve it. And I would switch it instead that your people are your best defenses. And when they see something weird and can point it out and similar, especially a security analyst, you need that partnership. And the moment we go down the victim blaming route, uh, you're going to, you might as well pack up and go to another company. Okay. So question here, and you know, this ties together really several things that have come in from the audience is, First, we talked about nation state actors, and then we start talking about non-state actors. But I caught in what a lot you were saying a few different times that there's this trickle down, which, correct me if I'm wrong, would seem to imply that there may be at least some sort of nationality or affiliation silo of some type of information naturally flows that way. Are there specific jurisdictions and parts of the world that we tend to see the nation state and even if whether they're the same or different, the non-state threats uh, emanate from as well. Okay, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, you know, I think there's largely an understanding that that with China, Chinese uh, operations and activities are very top down from the government. Um, you know, you're looking at whatever Bureau of, of the PLA is handling, you know, cyber intelligence and covert action. Uh, Russia and Eastern Europe, for some reason, seem to be more of a, a free for all. Uh, that goes to, you know, a culture that grew up in the 1990s after the, the Soviet Union folded, where essentially Russian actors did what they did to get paid. And if it was illegal, they did it because they needed to get paid. And if they did it because it was legal, that was okay. Uh, and I've worked on, on global software development projects with both Russians and, and others. And, you know, I continue to ask myself, why does India not play a bigger role as the bad guy in this space? It could, it has the talent, but it doesn't get tarred as often. Certainly it has a capability. I'm sure we all agree it has a capability. Pakistan has a capability. We can, I think we can all agree on that. But it is this idea that, that a cyber um, intrusion is something that can be conducted with a great deal of knowledge, but a very small amount of infrastructure often. Building enormously good code to do something really complicated is obviously a, pro a product development cycle, which requires organization. And, you know, but, you know, if we want to see that people are going to organize around a, a product or an activity or a campaign, the open source software, you know, milieu shows us that people can do this with very little kind of overhead guidance and they develop things as they need to. Uh, so once again, um, because the limits to, to making activity happen are fairly, fairly low. And, you know, I think it was either Tom or, or Robert who mentioned, um, you know, you only have to rattle so many doors before you'll have some luck. I mean, that's really where we are. Um, and that's not always a high level capacity. In terms of this asymmetry here that you're mentioning or what seems to be an asymmetry between what it costs to make trouble or to you know try to be the burglar, so to speak, and how much it might cost to defend against that, what type of disparity relationship are we looking at? Is this 
a simple multiple? Is it an order of magnitude? Is it something different altogether? Yeah, I'll, I'll add my own unique spin and say right off the bat that I think we've always had a mischaracterization of the imbalance where I hear too many defensive teams go, well, the adversary is going to get in anyways, or, oh, they're so good. They're so advanced, kind of to Tom's note. They're so sophisticated. What chance do we have against Russia? Like, it's not Russia. It's like seven people max that are focusing on you at any given time, and they're somewhere between the ages of 18 and 30, and government's their first job, and they have PowerPoint management too. Like, you can do this. So I think we over-enable the story of the adversary. What I think is fundamentally true, though, is if I prepare to – and this is, I hate analogies, but like if I prepare to a certain level, then all threats that level and below don't matter. It's not, there's no additional cost to defend something if I've already prepared for it. But if I haven't prepared, then any of the levels look really bad all very quickly. And so if I've never looked into my industrial operations environments before, never looked about remote accesses, don't do any monitoring, haven't tuned the firewall in 15 years, then some kid rattling the door is going to look like a Chinese state actor. Like it's going to be real bad for you. And so what we normally see is companies come out and go, I got compromised, but it was so sophisticated. And the reality, it's just hard to say, nah, we sucked at that. And like, we didn't put any investment in it. And man, we should be fired. Like, that's not the conversation that's happening. So I don't want to make it so light. There are plenty of companies who do all the right things and still get compromised. But we don't hear the defender wins nearly as often as we hear about the adversary wins. And there's a ton of defender wins. So in terms of thinking about the defender position, if we were to take, say, the refining industry, the petrochemical industry, and the electrical generation, and also transmission sectors, if we made a volume-weighted distribution curve and looked and said, okay, here's you know quintile one, quintile two, quintile three, and rank them both in terms of their position in the market and their competency and degree of hardness against cyber attacks, what would those curves look like right now? Well, I think I learned something on this, Gabe, uh, from uh, some activity at the Institute we did, gosh, uh, almost a decade ago, uh, maybe 2013, um, where uh, the Baker Institute was involved in uh, providing guidance and advice to the oil and gas industry uh, regarding a information sharing and analysis center. Uh, and mm -hmm. there are probably some people groaning, uh, you know, on the feed now who were involved in this. Um, and basically, at the end of the day, what happened uh, the, in cybersecurity, organizational size and heft matters. Uh, there's a reason why Google is better at security than some mom and pop, you know, shop that does, I, I, I don't know, web blog software or something. And what we noticed pretty quickly uh, just at every level, the big guys had, you know, and this is, like I said, six, seven years ago, uh, they had capacity that we didn't really even understand. You know, it was like, oh, you know, you know, the, the U.S. based and headquartered sisters have former NSA and CIA employees who know cyber. That's nice. Um, and that led to them. They, they have the capacity to work effectively with the United States government on intelligence that would be at high level, higher levels of classification uh, mm -hmm. than what DHS typically shares with everybody. Um, and so for the rest of the industry who built an ISAC, I mean, the big boys basically said, you know, we got this. Uh, and they worked together on, on some activities to, to protect themselves that were joint, you know, and, and oil companies always enter into, I mean, you, you, Gabe, you know this, I mean, Oil and gas companies enter into joint ventures to, to share risk all the time. Cyber is no different. Um, the ISAC, I've heard good things about. Uh, in the beginning, it was, it was a province of some consultancies. It didn't do a whole lot. Uh, finally, they got some good staff in who are former USG people, so they understood both sides of the coin. But, um, you know, getting things like, you know, intelligence sharing across companies is hard. And then the different, the different you know, isolated or, or vertical you talk about, um, the biggest difference I've noticed between the oil and gas folks and the electricity folks is NERC-SIP. Uh, NERC-SIP is this, this 
book of how to do security, basically, um, that is a, you know, electrical companies are regulated entities to a degree that oil companies are not. Uh, so the re reactions over time have been very different. Now, what does that mean to day-to-day -day response now? Uh, you know, I'm gradually seeing most companies in the energy sector, you know, fi even five years ago, it was, well, we need to hire all these compliance people in electricity, so we're better at it. Now they, I think, largely recognize, you know, you can, you can be completely in compliance and totally get nailed any day of the week. That's, that's how it goes. So, you know, I would say that, that, you know, the different verticals don't matter nearly as much as the amount uh, of, of spend that an entity has and the capacity of that entity to shoulder the burden with other companies that can do it well too. Robert or Tom, do you have anything to add on that? I'll just I'll just um, jump in real quick and say you know something one little thing um, the the reason that I used to get very frustrated and I still get frustrated with the term sophistication is because and this this relates to what uh, Robert and Chris were talking about actually um, the only thing that really matters with these attacks is impact and then and then it all sort of stems from there and a lot of times I would have the question from from federal government. Uh, you know, customers saying, uh, what's the sophistication level of, you know, group X, Y, Z? And can you talk to me about the sophistication level? And I, I don't think sophistication level is actually irrelevant. Um, it's not relevant. It's not a relevant issue. What matters is if um, you have, you know, some person rattling the doorknob and they actually open the door and wow, they're, they're into a nuclear power plant. Oh, look what I have. And then, and then like Robert said, oh no, it's, it's PLA3 or MSS, you know, they're in our system and, you know, we have to call the stops. So from my perspective, it's always been, it's always been a balance between, you know, sort of, you know, once we've determined impact, okay, if there's a severe impact, you know, it's one of those um, sort of highly improbable events that happens once, then yeah, we, we definitely want to look at, we want to look at who did it, but jumping the gun and saying, oh, this is a, this is a sophisticated actor seems, seems like, a problem that we we still may suffer from a little bit, and that's something that I I sort of beat into my students' head that, you know, if you're going to answer the question about sophistication, stop right there. You know, look at look at impact first, and then we can talk about, you know, what what happened. You know, we can we can reverse engineer the attack. We can reverse engineer malware. We can say, okay, how how did they go about doing this? What was their entry point? Were they persistent? You know, that sort of thing. So that's that's my two cents. <laughs> Yep. And, and from an industry kind of curve piece, which I, I violently agree with that one, because I'll answer your question, but I want to I want to comment on that because it's, it's good. Uh, I brought this up with Extended Time, the, the group that we tracked that did the Trisys malware. Um, I, mm -hmm. I had congressmen ask me, like, uh, you know, kind of what do you track as the most sophisticated threat? And I said, well, the, the one we care most about is Extended Time um, and Electrum. And they're like, well, what about PLA, whatever? What about, uh, you know, GRU? What about SVR? What about this? I'm like, look, Extended Time actually tried to kill people so i'm not really i don't really care how like clever they were in getting there they got damn close to killing people that's a really important group to track electrum they turned off the power in ukraine it's a really impactful group to track and so i think when we look at threat it's intent opportunity and capability and everybody focuses on capability we always ignore opportunity which is relative to us and intent which actually chris was talking about at the very beginning too matters a whole heck of a lot on do they actually have the intent on doing this to you, yes or no, which is also why state and non-state ends up getting really murky anyways. And mm -hmm. to a point that Tom made that I hope doesn't make anybody uncomfortable anyways, but we've seen state actors go to non-state groups and bring plenty of up-leveling to those teams with them. Um, not mm -hmm. only, and it's not just our foreign adversaries, according to Reuters reporting, we've also seen it where like an ex-NSA employee or two ended up in some shady UAE companies targeting civilians and journalists. Like this is a problem for countries all over the world. We just normally have more control on it in the US than some other countries can. But to answer your question, um, and I'll be really candid here, and especially if there's any of our customers and stuff on, I love all my children, don't get me wrong, but uh, power, power transmission, top of the stack, then power generation, then probably oil, oil refinery, and then probably more midstream operations than somewhere down the bottom corner, water and distribution. And it's related to, and that's not individual companies can spike up, don't get me wrong, but it's largely related to investments the community have made and can make and have the resources to make, which Chris is alluding to. And NERC SIP 
isn't the answer, which wasn't where Chris is going. So I, I agree with Chris. Nurk Sip wasn't the answer. It's that they got hit with Nurk Sip and back from presidential directive, I think, uh, what, 1998, uh, Clinton came out and said PDD 63, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure, we care. It, it's the electric grid. And so the electric community has been sort of rattled longer and had regulations thrown at them, and they kind of had to step up. Otherwise, the regulated industry was at risk. So to tie some of this together, maybe with a question that will hopefully elicit something good and scary since we're down to, I think, six minutes here until our uh, time expires is, you know, we've talked about power grids and pet cam plants and, you know, especially some of these attacks, Trisis and others. What are the what are the types of attacks that keep you guys up at night in terms of the systemic impacts they would have both in the immediate vicinity of where it happens and also potentially for its systemic consequences, perhaps even across things other than just the industry vertical it's in? I can, uh, I'll start but, and I'll be, I'll be brief. Um, I think from, from my perspective, it's, it's always about uh, the small, the small sort of less secured organizations that have larger connections being compromised and then causing failures that have little to do with cyber attack, but more to do with, you know, industrial control system design. We would refer to those maybe as a cascading failure. Um, that's mm -hmm. always, that's the thing that keeps me up at night because it might not look like anything unusual, 30, 30, 30,000 people lose power in Northern Virginia. That's pretty common when any thunderstorm rolls through here or Southern Maryland uh, where, where Robert is. <laughs> um, so, so that's not a big deal. So we don't think much about that. Um, but what if that starts happening, you know, in a number of areas and then, and then there is something uh, similar to the 2003, you know, North, Northeast power grid, which was, which was caused by cascading failure, not, not cyber attack, but how mm -hmm. will we know how, how, how will we know and what will that look like and how will you know when the power goes off? I mean, if, if I were, a, you know, an impactful hacker, <laughs> not sophisticated, um, I would, I would go, I would do it during a thunderstorm, you know, during a derecho, do it, do it at a time when nobody's, when people are going to think that it's something else. Um, yeah. And that's, that's, that's what keeps me up at night. And that's, I'll stop right there. Cause I know there's less, very little Oh, man, you're telling us that we're down in Hurricane Alley. Yeah, I'll turn over to you, uh, Robert and Chris. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I violently agree with the small side. Um, I get asked this question a lot, especially on the congressional side. And I tell them, like, look, I'm confident BP, Southern Company, Chevron, Excel, they're going to get it all right. And I'm worried for them and I want to do more. But like, I'm not worried about that. What I'm terrified is the small side of the house and the small players. And, and it's kind of the same vein was Tom, that Tom was talking about. But I care when it's overt and it scares the hell out of me to think of a 30 minute power outage in D.C. three weeks before the election or uh, taking a uh, petrochemical attack like Trisis, but only killing 20 people a month before the election. Small events are hard for states to respond to. And we think, oh, well, they crossed the line and they attacked us and they killed 20 people. We're going to war. No, we're not. It's actually too small. It sucks. It's horrible. It's, it's scary as hell, but it's too small. So then you have a government that doesn't look like it's acting strong enough and it's getting baited into something with a foreign power. You have a response where sanctions aren't enough for what happened and you're throwing the electorate sort of out of balance and they're, they're blaming the incumbent party no matter who it is because they feel unsafe. And the ability to use small form cyber attacks and infrastructure to influence policy at a very large level. I mean, you'd have Congress regulating out existence, whatever industry got hit just to look strong. Um, those small attacks can be extremely impactful, especially during tense times. Yeah, and uh, you, know, I, you know, things that keep me up at night, we're in Houston, there's more refining going on here than just about anywhere else on the planet. And there's petrochem attached to it. And the first time I heard the words cyber Bhopal together, I was, you know, a bit panicked by them. Um, but you know, and, and nuclear is obviously scary. You know, if we do another panel on this, we should invite my, my friend Chris Spirito, who does nothing but international nuclear agreements on this stuff and gets countries with nuclear. Like he keeps coming back from countries. I'm like, they have nuclear power? Really? Barbados? Wow. I mean, I, I exaggerate, but, um, but I think the real issue here, I mean, and, and, and both of my panelists look at the small side, 
I want to look at one other thing, and that is responsible activity by the United States and norms that the United States engages in. You know, there was an explosion in Iran, what, yesterday or the day before? It was a big explosion. I saw it all over Twitter. And then immediately there were 8 zillion tweets saying, oh, the U.S. government's up to some stuff now, man. And I'm like, yeah, maybe they're hellfire fire missiles with, with knives in it too. But, you know, for the United States, you know, I, I don't want to throw the norm setting activity under the bus. This is something that should still continue. And the countries that are around the world, you know, I watched a, a former director of NSA and Joe and I have a horrible argument once about was, was Stuxnet a good idea or not? It was fascinating to watch. I learned a lot. And I'm in the NIE camp still. Um, so this is something that we as a country can react to by policy as well. Well, excellent, gentlemen. I think we are right on schedule here. I love how we have a little bit of, you know, scary Halloween horror movie and then close it out by saying we don't want to cede the field to the Chinese, Russians, Iranians, and DPRK as the normative standard setters. And really appreciate each of you three carving out time to be with us and share your expertise and knowledge and experience today and want to thank each of you in the audience for being so generous with your time. Without you, we don't have these great discussions. We really appreciate it. Hope you have a great weekend and stay Corona free. Thanks, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you, Gabe.